Welcome to How Brands Are Built, where branding professionals get into the details of what they do and how they do it. I'm your host, Rob Meyerson. Thanks for listening. This first season, I'm mostly talking to namers, and today I'm talking to Shannon DeYoung. She's the CEO of House of Who, an art house and agency based in Oakland, California, whose clients include Google, among others. Outside of her naming expertise, Shannon's an artist, a speaker, and a podcast host. She hosts Artist CEO, where she uses her story to talk about how business and art can work together. Shannon just exudes creative energy. She's also introspective and has thought a lot about how she can keep her creative work fresh. She offers up a bunch of great ideas in our conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Shannon. Thanks for making the time to chat. My pleasure. Good to be here. Let's let's zero in on, on name generation. So you get a naming brief, you sit down to start generating names. Walk me through what, what you do next. Well, I'm a bit of a hummingbird when it comes <laughs> to creative. The very first thing I do is just read and absorb and listen, um, mm-hmm. letting it kind of sink in because... Sometimes it's the stuff that I wouldn't hear on first blush or the nuance of what the client is saying or not saying um, that ends up proving to be a really fruitful area. You know, if someone's like, here's the brief, we want it to be about connectivity and speed, you're like, all right, network, hive, B, <laughs> prism, nexus, fast, <laughs> cheetah, pounce, run, paw. You know, it's like, that's great. And then once that has run out, the place that's going to be sweet, where it's going to be truly helpful to the client and where the client could not maybe have gone on their own, is to think about the subtlety of what they're asking for and the subtlety Mm -hmm. of what the right answer could be. Um, Especially now with, you know, the world, everything, brands, naming, trademarks being so cluttered. um, It's really about these little teeny slivers of space, whether it's creative space, strategic space, where there's going to be something truthful and effective and clear. Mm -hmm. So I like to just do a lot of receptive work first, especially because naming is such a generative, productive act. So talk to me a little bit more about uh, in- interrogating the brief. Is there anything you can point to that that works? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess broadly, I just want to ask every question until I have no questions left and I'm sitting there on the call or looking at the brief going, okay, uh, okay, I guess there's nothing left to do but start naming. Like if I have Mm -hmm. any question at all in my head, even if it's a playful one or a curious one, like, hey, this maybe doesn't have anything to do with naming, but how did the, how did this company start? And then I think practically um, I will interrogate a brief or dissect it, um, but just making sure the strategy is, watertight. Um, You know, the number one factor for success in any naming project is the strategy. It's always about making sure that you're clear what the ask is and what this name is going to do for you. So I will always look a brief through and through and they, um, and just know that there are those different pieces that I know need to be covered, right? I have to be very clear on what the brand, you know, the master brand or the product brand is about. The position, the positioning must be ultra clear. Mm-hmm. One thing that I find really helpful is coming back to the the simplicity of this particular exercise, which is just a small part of branding writ large. Mm-hmm. It's a very important part. It's an essential part, but just reminding everyone, hey, this is a name. There's a lot of other things that the brand is going to be. What do you need the name to do? Well, let's talk about a, a hypothetical. I don't know how often this really happens, but let's let's pretend that you've been given a, a perfect brief. Where do you start? Any process or steps that you follow consistently? Oh, yeah. Now the fun begins. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, 
my my number one thing that I always do, so I mentioned I'm a bit of a hummingbird, and then other times I act like a drill. Um, and explain what you mean by by those two metaphors, yeah. just so that I'm clear. <laughs> sure. Um, as a hummingbird, I like to give myself permission to. So creatively, I think I need to be able to flit from idea to idea. So when I first sit down, um, I really like to give myself a ton of freedom. Um, even though later on I will be more thorough and more um, exacting and I will make sure that I've covered my bases and what am I missing and where can I mine? And that's when the the drilling comes in. Um, mm. The initial phase for me is always one of freedom and following the thread wherever it goes. It's It's organic. It's potentially disorganized. It's kind of like a little kid with a bunch of sugar who <laughs> just wants to like run around and like, Oh, Oh, what's this over here? Oh, look at that. Oh, look, it's a kitten. Oh, look, oh wait, uh, mommy, <laughs> can I have another, you know, it's like I, and I let myself do that because I know that that's where a lot of the creative wisdom is. And at the very least, even if that initial flush of naming doesn't produce names that are going to be viable because like I said the way the brain works right you're going to you're going to have to be recycling and and going over lots of synonyms and things that um maybe aren't the quote unquote diamond in the rough um that's where you get the volume that's where you get the the quantity at least for me I should say I get the quantity and the volume and the breadth and the mm -hmm. inspiration and the curiosity so I can cover a lot of ground if I just let my mind flit from beautiful little idea to beautiful little idea. And just to be clear, how are you in practical terms? How are you working at this point? Are you often on a whiteboard or working with post-it notes or yeah. are you in software of some yeah, sort? Great question. Um, I would say that, well, first of all, I would say even my method is a little hummingbird-like in I also follow wherever the impulse is in terms of how to work. Mm -hmm. So in the first several hours, um, I really do just follow however I want to work. I start totally on impulse. It's like, have I been sitting at my computer all day and I'm just now getting to it? Well, opening up an Excel spreadsheet, while it can be very helpful later on with organizing, um, right now is going to just kill my creative mojo. So why don't I grab a pen and paper and my running shoes and walk outside and go for a walk? I mean, so I have even driven before an hour away to a beautiful setting, um, especially when it, when it's a particular kind of project and I need, you know, more tranquil kind of open, expansive ideas. And um, given myself physical space and physical beauty um, in order to start unleashing. Um, other times I work a lot in just good old Word or good old Google Docs um, mm -hmm. or a text doc. Increasingly now I have, when I, when I have a limited amount of time, I actually will start in Excel because... Mm -hmm. Anytime you take your pen and paper and you go out into nature, <laughs> it takes longer. <laughs> but I would say that um, I love starting with pen and paper. That's always a great way to start because you know that no matter what, you're going to be ending up back at a machine. And I'm just curious when you when you do wander off into into nature with a pad, you, you don't <laughs> you don't have Wi-Fi access when you're doing this. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's part of the part of the genius, I think, <laughs> is that um, to totally disconnect, I like to give myself a chance to see what I can do without any influence, I guess I should say without any digital influence. So be because I think once I start getting into um, using and there are a lot of great tools out there, and they're absolutely um, essential, you know, the you know, dictionaries and thesauruses. And I think um, there's something called One Lookup and mm -hmm. WordNick and um, and Wikipedia, not even for words, but just for ideas and how are certain concepts related to other concepts. Um, these are all great. And for me, that's more like middle process or or toward end of the generation process. 
um, when I'm starting to slow down a little bit from my raw creative fire. I think the best stuff has come from when I'm actually just sitting back a bit. Um, and sometimes I physically do this. I sit back from the computer. I sit yeah. back from my desk. Maybe I don't even have a pen and paper. And I just, it's kind of that like shower moment, that light bulb moment of, hold on, hold on. Let me take a break from trying to generate, you know, 20 words a second and just go back to that initial listening and thinking. It's a very important step because sometimes I have had that moment and it's like, oh, that's the name. Like you Mm -hmm. just have this moment. You're like, that's it. Yes. And you know that it's probably not it. <laughs> or, or it's not available. Or it's not available. It's usually, yeah, usually that's the next thought. <laughs> I think I need to have a feeling of, ooh, I've had several moments like that where I just go, yes, oh, yes. You, you've brought up timing. How do naming projects go for you from a timing standpoint? And what's the ideal? Is it uh, to have a huge block of time in front of you? Or do you like to work in little sprints? Mm. Yeah. Well, the ideal timeline is one that is two weeks for creative, (laughs) where I have the opportunity to try out a lot of different modes. No matter what, at some point, I need to have a long block of time. And that long block of time is always relative to the timeline and size of the project. So if it's a quick little nameless that I'm helping another agency with, um, a long block of time might be two to four hours. I mean, that mm-hmm. might feel like a good amount of time to sink in. I do feel like the minimum amount of time total is four hours. Like I, I feel like it's after, um, the four hours is when you can really get to some good stuff. Um, and then you do hit a wall and you're like, okay, I need to refresh. Let's talk about tools. You mentioned a few, but I'd love to just get a list from you if, if you have it off the top of your head of online or offline tools that you like to have handy for every project, or maybe there are some that you find you only use once in a blue moon. Sure. Yeah. Um, I have to admit, while I'm always on the search for new tools, I kind of, I kind of feel a little boring or like old school, because as of yet, I haven't found a tool that's better than my brain. Um, But with that said, I definitely use um, various dictionaries. So I might have a um, a dictionary here, um, whether that's a Webster's. Ideally, you have a full original OED, and you can open up and look through etymologies. But Um, I do not have one of those. I do Mm -hmm. use, I think it's called OED online, um, or etymology, um, etymology etymology.com, I believe. Um, one look or one look up, um, uh, just really dictionary.com. It's not the best dictionary and often weeding through all of the like ads and crossword puzzles and whatever I find very distracting, but it works as a tool because often it gives me that, um, base, like those base of synonyms that I start from like, okay, here is fast and dictionary.com or synonym.com. They're going to give me a definition and synonym, like the top 10 synonyms. And then those synonyms I using my brain, or my other favorite naming tool, which is just Google, um, then get inspired to take that synonym and try and find what I call sort of like related or extended conceptual synonyms um, to go from. I also just use Google. And the way I use it is I will start, embarrassingly, by just taking words in the brief or in the pathways and just typing them in. Like, hey, let's just start. What is the what is the Google brain and what is the world and what is the internet? How, how do they relate to this word or this pathway that I need to explore? Then I go into, I use a lot just images, Google images, and I'll um, type in various words or um, whether it's from the brief or even words that I have um, 
found that capture some kind of essence, even if it's not the right word, I'll write that into Google Images. Mm -hmm. And then I'll get a visual palette or a visual collage of more things that stimulate more thought. That's a great idea. I love the the Google Images idea just to to break yourself out of, I mean, frankly, you're looking at words a lot when you're doing naming. So it's even just a nice break for the eyes. Is there anything particular that you found works well for writer's block, so to speak? I want to think carefully before I say this, because I might jinx myself. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't experience writer's block very often. <laughs> um, maybe more than writer's block, I just get... Um, constricted and rigid and I get too narrow in my thinking and it just gets dry. So I think that's probably my version of it. So it's not a full block, um, but it just sort of is, um, there's no juice anymore. <laughs> and what I, what I always do then is the, the stupid rule and the 10 minute rule, <laughs> the, the stupid rule. I just made these up right now. Can you tell my neighbor? <laughs> the stupid rule is that I have to write down things that are stupid. Like, all right, all right. Okay. Now I want the next 10 names, 50 names to be totally stupid. Like you would never name this, that you would never even show it to the client. You'd be like embarrassed to, to do it, you know? And, and the stupid rule when I, I love the name, um, when you do that. So I guess it's sometimes it tells you, OK, I'm done because I, I, I did this and I feel like I've gotten everything out of my system, essentially. And, and then other times does it 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 spurs another wave? Well, I, I don't think that just feeling like, oh, I'm out of ideas is the right feeling for telling me that it's time to stop. Usually that tells me that it's. I'm, I'm coming upon, yeah, that first wave or a, a dry spot and I have to push through it. Um, the 10 minute rule to finish yes. up that thought is just do anything for 10 minutes. If you want to stop after that, okay, then maybe it's not the right time to do it. But most likely you'll get into flow and you'll be on the treadmill and it'll just whoop, and off you go. Um, I think it's absolute that way with creativity. I mean, anything, right? It's I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Okay. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Oh, this is fun. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so in that example, what are you doing? What are you doing for 10 minutes? I, I just want to understand, are you doing something naming related for 10 minutes? If that's it. And maybe you only get 10 minutes of naming right now and then do something else and come back to it. I mean, that's sort of, if I'm really feeling blocked or I don't like it, I'll just say, okay, 10 more minutes, just do 10 more minutes. <laughs> and so, you know, I've even done that to myself three times in a row. Like, ugh, right. I don't want to. Okay. How about, Hey, Hey, how about another 10 minutes? Okay. You're making, making deals with yourself. Exactly. <laughs> Are there any name, specific name ideas or n naming tropes? Uh, you know, like the L Y on the end of all these startup names. Is there anything in particular that you're sick of seeing or that you, you've sort of identified as a trend that you try to steer clear of? Well, it's a trend that isn't my favorite, but I'm not yet able to steer clear of it because it's so pervasive. But I must say the verbable name uh. is lovely in theory, and <clears throat> there's nothing overtly obnoxious about it. But here's what I don't like. <laughs> I, I don't like it because people ask for it just because they think that that's going to be a successful name. And uh -huh. I hate to be a broken record, but I want to go back to this idea of, yeah, but does it make sense strategically? And I have gotten a lot of that, like, we want it to be one syllable, real word, ideally verbable, um, which is nice, but there's going to be trade-offs. So to, to what extent do you think verbability is, is a real thing though? Because that's, you know, Rob, Google, is, Google is a noun, right? I mean, if, thank you. If so anything. is Apple. So is, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Uber is a ad adjective. And I mean, this is what's so funny is that I look around, I'm like, how many names are actually, and people are like, you know, like Twitter. I'm like, <laughs> Twitter is not, you don't Twitter something, you tweet it. They can't, it's like, <laughs> and, and I don't, and I don't know, honestly, if that came from 
Twitter, the company, the brand itself, but I don't think so. I don't even think that they created their own language. Like that was done by people. That's the thing. Right. People will do the, this is the nature of language, right? That's, I mean, th this is my background is linguistics. I, I started as a linguist and I love language. And the beauty of language is, is why I'm not a prescriptive, but a descriptive language, a uh, linguist, mm -hmm. which just means language is alive. Language is organic and it will extend and bend and twist itself as memes, as trends, as tropes from person to person in this way that is beyond any one individual or brand. Absolutely agree with you. Uh, the, I think what I hear you saying is that it's not necessarily our decision as the people behind the brand as to whether or not people end up using it as a verb. That's that's their decision and, and one that they'll likely make subconsciously. Um, but then on top of that, I, I also think that brands need to be really careful about trying to impose that type of prescriptive language on onto consumers or onto their customers because it aside from it potentially not working it could also just really backfire in terms of making them look silly you talk about brand truth a lot I, I think i saw it on the house of who website and i believe you give talks about about it as well can you just explain what brand truth is and and how it relates to naming yeah um brand truth is the very simple idea that one, you don't have to be fake in order to succeed. And two, your truth is going to be your most valuable asset. I think that the branding industry and the marketing industry is often known for putting layers on and making things shiny and beautiful and glossy. And there's a time and a place for that. I'm most interested in peeling the layers back and getting to the heart of what is essential. And if you are a business and a brand, there's something truthful about your product, your offering, your culture, and the essence of who you are. And that is going to be your sweet spot. I think that that actually ends up being, um, especially now with the way the world is going, people want, people want realness. People want to be able to connect with a brand um, and its truth in, in all of its glory. It wants it to be whole. Um, and I think in terms of naming, it, uh, it drills down the value of essential information, right? You get one word, one name to communicate who you are. And hopefully you have a bunch of other brand assets that go along with it, but sometimes you don't. And it's one word that may appear in, in print, it may, it may be verbal, it may be someone just passing on the street. And I think in that one name, there should be something really essential about who you are, and it should be real. And I think also just in terms of the, the process of naming, I mean, we're talking very tactical. Um, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to go to all these fancy bells and whistles and naming trends and you know, what's going to be cool in five years and what's most searchable. All of those things are important to consider because they're realities. But I think in the process of naming, what's most important is to think of something really clear and clean and concise. And I would call that truthful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we recently worked on Google Home Mini and that's not a sexy name necessarily. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not like, oh God, that's so fun. And you just say it and it's like an inside joke and it's cool and it's hip and it's, you know, but it's pretty simple and it just makes sense. And it's at the heart of what the thing is. It's a small, cute version of Google Home and there you have it. So I just, I kind of feel like, people often try too hard when they right. don't, they don't have to, you don't, there doesn't have to be anxiety that, you know, you don't have to worry like, Oh God, we have to be super creative or edgy or unique or, you know, differentiated. Yeah. Those things. Sure. <laughs> they, that's, that's where your strategy comes in. But, um, but when it gets down to naming, um, I say, start with the truth. 
Yeah, I often find myself reminding clients that no one will ever think as hard about this name as as we're about to do and and try to relieve a little of that pressure and temptation to, to overthink it. I often say to people, my secret as a namer is that naming is the most important thing you will ever do for your business and it doesn't matter. <laughs> like at some point, you know, get as close as you can and do the best you can. But as long as you, again, as long as you're on strategy and you're communicating what you need to communicate, you're, you're fine. Well, I, I love that Google home mini name. I think it's a good example of a name that's great, but you don't realize it is. And, and the reason for that is, or the way to realize how great it is, is to think of what they could have called it. Right. To think of all the things they might have done and some of the atrocities that other other companies have have waged uh, uh, upon us with, uh, you know, more more fanciful attempts to convey what is ultimately a pretty simple message. Yeah, I think when I was a younger and new at naming, um, I mean, actually, for a long while, I was like, oh, I, I want to get that that perfect name I want to have on my resume then like, I want to have named Twitter. Like that's <laughs> right. I, I want to get something that people hear it and they're like, Oh my God, that's such an amazing name. And I'd be like, yeah, thanks. And I think at this point I really let that go. And I realized that it's far more satisfying to just get a name that's right and just makes sense. And if I never get associated with it, great. And if it does yeah. its job, Great. Um, last question. What is your favorite thing about naming or, or generating names? Oh, gosh. I think that it's um, a, a little moment to play God. <laughs> it's like <laughs> for, for just these few hours, I get to create an entire world. I mean, maybe it's like um, it's I don't have children. And so maybe it's getting to name all of these potential little babies that will grow up and go out into the world. And there's sort of like a maternal pride about giving my creative oomph to something that will live on past me. <laughs> I think, I think that's part of it. And I think the other part is, um, yeah, it like satisfies this um, like I said, the hummingbird in me, I, when I was a kid, I was a very mercurial, um, precocious little thing. I was super teeny with shock white hair and I would bounce around and just talk and 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 talk. And, talk and, talk and, and I think at some point people were like, okay, thank you for the 15 cartwheels and the story about rainbows, but <laughs> you know, it's time to, it's time to be quiet now. And I think that energy, that childlike enthusiasm for, for language and ideas gets to play when I'm naming and then it gets to saddle up next to and ride along with the other part of my name uh, sorry, the other part of my brain, um, which is um, then wants to make it all make sense and, and put it all into structure and find a place for it in the world. Shannon, thanks so much for making the time to chat. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to How Brands Are Built. If you like what you heard, please subscribe at iTunes or your podcasting service of choice and leave a rating and a review. I'd love to hear what you think. You can also follow us on Instagram or visit us online at howbrandsarebuilt.com. While you're there, you can sign up for the newsletter, check out show notes, or contact me with any questions or suggestions. For more from Shannon, check out houseofwho.com or find them on Twitter or Instagram. And check out her podcast, Artist CEO. She talks a bit on the show about how she takes her freelance naming career and turns it into an agency. You can find Artist CEO on iTunes or at helloartistceo.com. How Brands Are Built is a production of Heirloom Agency, LLC. Our theme music is by Isha Erskine Project. I'm Rob Meyerson, and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks again.